Hey folks, welcome to What's Next Beyond Service. This is episode 13 and it's entitled GI Joe. And there's a reason for that and you know you'll you'll find out as we go along in the progression of the show today. Um, with me today I have uh, Michael Clemmer. Uh, he's our guest. Uh, Michael, welcome to the show and if you can just give us a quick introduction of of who Mike is. Yeah. Hey, I'm uh, glad to be here, Scott. So, uh, I like you said, uh, my name's Mike Clemmer. I am a 20 year Army veteran. I'm the current director of military affairs for MSA, the safety company, and Bacharach Incorporated. And I also own my own little side venture called Aerial Resupply Coffee. Outstanding. And, you know, for folks that, that don't know, Mike and I are connected on LinkedIn. So Mike's been on LinkedIn for a while. Um, I've kind of watched his transition. Uh, from military service, from the Army, into what he's doing now. And Mike is a man of wisdom. Uh, he is he is often posting on LinkedIn, and the stories that he shares really resonate with me, and, and obviously they do with others too, because he has a bit of a following, um, folks that are interested in, in what he's doing, uh, that enjoy his advice. And so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring Mike on the show today, uh, because this program is all about sharing stories of people who served in the military and have transitioned from service and they're doing good things now. And everyone's got a story to tell. You know, we talk about challenges, we talk about, you know, things that went well, but it's all so that people that are going to transition have a bit of a path to look to. You know, they have folks that they can, can see, hey, this person was successful or this person had trouble in this area, whatever it might be. Uh, and so they, they have that as a benchmark. They have these stories that they can look to and kind of figure out, you know, I might want to incorporate some of what they've done into my transition plan. So that's kind of the, you know, uh, the impetus of, of why we do these stories. So with that said, Mike, let's, uh, let's just hop right into this. Uh, tell us, sure. you know, what are some of the important things uh, that, apply to to you and your service what are the things that you want to share with us about your time in the army yeah so i mean i i had a great experience in the army you know i, I think we've all you, know, you look backwards at what your service was and why you joined and kind of the, the benchmarks or the time stamp that have happened along the way and you can really look at some of the decisions you made as like key transition points even inside the service so you know just in joining the army back in 2000, you know, I joined right before September 11, 2001. So I joined pretty much at the tail end, I would say, of the Gulf War Army, where you know it was still focused primarily on you know training rotations. The the army and and the service was coming out of Kosovo and had done a few Kosovo rotations, and you know it was I think really kind of finding itself and didn't really know what would happen. And then we all know what happened after September 11th. And I think that really changed, you know, my trajectory and the trajectory of a lot of different people. And so I think, you know, for me, I looked at, you know, kind of my first six years in service I spent as an enlisted military intelligence professional and, you know, enlist and, and really worked with um, some of the Air Force intelligence systems. And then you know, I, after we came back from Iraq with 1st Cavalry Division, I had an opportunity to go do some fielding uh, for new equipment out of Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And it was then that I kind of learned that the Army was calling and making a, a huge call for commissioning for officers because of the officer shortage. And so I threw my name in the ring and, you know, was lucky enough to be selected through a lot of hard work and was commissioned as a quartermaster officer. And, spent the rest of the remaining 13 years, you know, working behind the scenes and supporting everyone else um, in logistics. Yeah, so you went, for, as you said, so you were enlisted and you did your time on the intelligence side of the house. What, what was that like? Uh, that's, you know, that's a pretty interesting field because there's, you know, you interface with a lot of different people and, you know, you've got information that is absolutely important to you know how we do things, especially when we're in a deployed environment. What what were some of the things that that you enjoyed about that? You know, I liked the MI field is really a a very interesting field, and I think it's 
you know, often misunderstood. There's the oxymoron about what military intelligence actually is, which, right. which we, you know, in service people we laugh about all the time. I, I do feel like, you know, from a from a from an intellectual standpoint, it's really about processing information and making it matter to the people who are going to be taking that and then enacting a plan. And so it was, you know, even though my function as a common ground station operator with the J Stars aircraft was a very small piece of the overall picture, it, it did help, you know, even in my time in Iraq from 2004 to 2005, kind of shape what we were doing and shape what First Cav was able to accomplish, you know, in, in Baghdad, you know, during that time window at OIF2. So I, I you know, I, I really enjoyed my time in MI. It was great. Yeah. And then being a quartermaster, my my brother-in-law served his total time was about 30 years. Uh, he was in the army. Uh, he was uh, a cannon cocker for about 10 years. And then the drawdown came in the you know very early 90s. And right. he transitioned to the intel field and did that for, I think, two years. And then from there decided that the quartermaster uh, profession was, you know, what fit best for him. So he did that the, re the remaining uh, part of his career. He was brought back on active duty and he, you know, deployed over into the Persian Gulf with OIF and, you know, did a lot of good stuff. But he, he, his last few years, he was into a lot of high speed stuff with, you know, future logistics for the army and, you know, uh, trucks that, that drive themselves, you know, right. uh, aerial drone deliveries and resupply stuff. So, yeah, he, he really enjoyed what he did. So, but, you know, being a quartermaster, there's probably a lot of, you know, it's, it's not just supply and, and logistics, right? I think, uh, did you also get into the the financial side of that with uh, the, the money in for, uh, you know, budgeting and, and things like that as well? Well, I did. I think, you know, you, you, you know, my, my first couple of years as a quartermaster officer, you know, I spent really focused on building forward operating bases in Afghanistan. And so, you know, a lot of that had to do with the monetary side, working with some of the logistics elements like KBR, Dyncor, Floor, and the log cap contractors, but also, you know, just master planning. Like I didn't even, if you go back to what I did in 2010 with, you know, 4th Infantry Division, where we were in Kandahar and building a FOB, like if you had told me beforehand that I'd have to figure out how to expand you know, a football field into a one kilometer square U.S. Army base to put 2,000 American soldiers on it, I would have been like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I have no idea how to do it. And here I am, a lieutenant, and that's exactly what I did. And so, you you know, from a monetary standpoint, yeah, you start getting into budget forecasting, you start getting into the, the, the money side, con contracts, how to manage contracts, how to even award contracts. And, and then on the other side, how to maintain contractual performance like those things you know people think quartermasters they think beans bullets beds they think how am i going to get my fuel but they typically don't see the other side of it which is all the administrative things to make those all of that possible no absolutely and, and that's yeah that's the reason for the question because a lot of folks don't and you know not they don't necessarily need to know but right but when they do know it helps them do their jobs better because they right. know about resources they know who should i be asking about you know how to get this done and you know oftentimes we find that you know in relationships especially professionally you know you, you can't just be looking forward with your hand out behind you you know hoping that somebody sees it right a lot of times it's important to turn around and and walk across the bridge to maybe try to figure out a little bit about what that other person's doing mm -hmm. uh, because you may have some information that will help enable what they're doing for you. You know, it's kind of like that old adage, you know, what do I know? Uh, uh, <laughs> of course, I would forget it now, but it's, uh, I think it's, uh, what do I know? Who needs to know it? And have I told them yet? Right. right you know, that, right. that that's very important. I, I, I don't know whether that's something you guys had in, in the army in terms of, you know, a saying like that, but, you know, having information and sharing information is so important to how you proceed and, and how you get things done. And yeah, I know when I was in Iraq, uh, you know, back in 2003, 
kind of a similar situation. Uh, my my boss, uh, you know, we were the combat support element of the 15th Mu. And, you know, once we got to a point where we could stop in Iraq, you know, we had to set up kind of a similar thing. I had to set up a compound and we had all kinds of cats and dogs with this. Some of the three letter agencies, you know, uh, some special ops folks, uh, you know, we even had some Brits with us. So we had to set up a, you know, a site and man, you know, my boss was like, uh, Hey, that's what you're going to do. You know, I was, <laughs> I was his XO, right. and, you know, cause he had other things to do as well. So I was absolutely not expecting that. And it's amazing uh, the things that you learn and the other professionals that are there learning right along with you. Um, luckily, at some point, we had the CDs roll in on our location, and they made all the fundamental things so much better and easier because that's what they do. You know, they, they come in, they do distribution with power, they, you know, they build some things, uh, they give you water, you know, potable water and water to, to bathe with. And that was, boy, that was a blessing uh, after not having a, a bath for like, you know, 40 plus days because you were on the move and, you know, we were told, Hey, water's for brushing your teeth, drinking. And that's, that's about it. You know, you can't, you can't wash your stuff. So, you know, it, when those guys rolled in, they, they made quality of life uh, a lot better, sure. but, but anyhow, yeah, you know, logistics uh, is, is multifaceted and uh, those that understand that, uh, are the ones that are successful, you know, both as a logistician or the people that are on the other end, the trigger pullers, those guys that understand uh, the logistics piece, uh, they are absolutely willing to work with you and not expect the fairy dust, you know, planning. You know, right. So 100%. yeah, any, anyhow, yeah, I'm kind of getting on a, on a soapbox there. So uh, now what was the impetus, you know, career-wise to transition from the military or were you at your 20 year mark and, and you were like, Hey, I'm good. Um, tell, tell me about that. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think everybody kind of looks at that 20 year mark as the break point, right? You either continue and you, you continue your service and you move on because you can see your career path or it's kind of the natural kind of culmination of what you've been doing and you just determine to get out. And for me, you know, my decision to exit the army, had less to do with the number of years and more to do with my family situation. And so, you know, because of my, you know, my mother-in-law's health and my wife, you know, we had left the Air Command and Staff College in 2017 and had really looked at Fort Lee as almost a final destination for us. And, and it was nice because we wanted to, we wanted to resettle down here in the Charlottesville area where, we're, where we are now. It's a beautiful Fort place. Lee, yeah, and, and Fort Lee kind of provided that that aspect or that that enabling function for us, and you know, so you know, I, mean, I worked extremely hard my last two years at Fort Lee for 59th Ordnance Brigade, and we kind of really, me and my wife had had looked at, you know, what does the next 10 years of the Army look like, and you know, quite honestly, we looked at it as you know, my promotion potential was there. There was a lot of good things that my Army career could have, you know, could have continued on, and you know, I would have been. I would be very successful in the army. And on the other side, we also realized that we were going to move probably five to seven times in those 10 years. Uh, we were going to be away from family when we had already been away from family for 10 years. And that the likelihood that I would probably end up being a geographical bachelor for many of those that time period, it, it really didn't sit well with us. And so we just decided that, you know, we had, you know, my wife and I, because it was a joint decision, that it was time to, you know, hang it up. We had a, you know, we had a good run. We did 20 years of service for the country, which I think is, you know, absolutely outstanding. And for every retiree, you know, exactly, or, well, for every veteran, forget retiree, for everybody who's ever served, you know, that's, that, that's an amazing accomplishment. And, you know, it was just my time. And so I decided, we decided to hang it up. All right. And, for so many veterans that, you know, have transitioned or even, as you said, people that are, you know, that don't necessarily retire, they, they do their time and then they make a decision. Right. And then, right. you know, hopefully folks are leaving on their own terms because um, that's important, too. But, you know, the things that you said are so consistent with what so many people decide, you know, especially once you're married and you have other obligations 
aside from yourself, you know, a, a wife or a husband, kids, other family members, uh, you know, they all have a vote too, uh, or they should, right? Mm -hmm. And the the farther you go in a career, the more commitment there is, uh, and the more time that you're spending probably away from those other things that you want to spend time with. And so then right. you have decisions to make about, you know, dividing up time. And we always talk about trying to achieving balance, you know, or try to achieve balance and keep balance. That that's, that's extremely hard uh, in, in the military. We all know what we want to do, uh, but sometimes uh, based on the nature of your job or being deployed, you know, uh, it, it's very difficult. And so it's not uncommon that once folks get to that 20 year mark, uh, it's very appealing to look at, you know, well, what are the other alternatives? Uh, I, my my background was very, you know, kind of a similar thing. It came down into a family choice, right? I mean, of course, there are other things that, that you think about. But for me, it was just my path forward, the way that it was going to go, was just going to be time away from family. Uh, sure. And part of it was a decision that we were going to make as a family, because it was a, ge a geographical situation. The family didn't want to go where the Marine Corps was going to have me. Right. And so so it was time to go. And fortunately, I was at the point like you, I was at uh, right at 20 years. So my decision was was to do exactly that. And yeah, I mean, I miss the military. I, I love the Marine Corps. I'm always going to. But it was the right decision uh, for me right. because, you know, it, it was about about family. So so let's let's talk about that point now. So you're you're leaving the military. Let's talk transition. Uh, for you, transition wise, did uh, I I'm in looking at your uh, LinkedIn profile? I see and I do recall that you got into the Skillbridge program. So that's unique, right? Because not many people a even know what the Skillbridge program is, much less have the opportunity to participate in that. So right. for folks that may not know, the skill bridge is a DOD thing that there are companies that partner up and allow folks who are approved in the military through their chain of command time to go work with a company for, you know, three months or six months, you know, six months, I guess, if you're lucky to where, you know, you're, you're working with them, you're understanding all the processes, you know, what it's like to be in a civilian capacity working with a company outside of the military, you're still getting paid, you know, your, your military uh, job is still paying you, you just go to a different location every day. And so it's a great opportunity. So fortunately, you were afforded that opportunity. What what was that like? Um, what can you tell us about your participation in SkillBridge and then uh, I think Apex, the yeah. company that you were working with? Well, before I do that, and let me if I can take it a little bit of a different direction before I talk about APEX. No, nope, absolutely. Let me do this. So, so when I when I first made the decision to retire, you know, the, the the common wisdom that you'll hear from a lot of different people that retirement is really a two year activity when you're exiting the army, like you should know, or exiting the service. And so, you, really, I theoretically should have been starting the retirement process in 2018 for a 2020 exit. Well, because we hadn't made the decision to, me and my wife hadn't made the decision to retire, I actually retired within a nine month window. So I started accelerating my transition and my job search and my networking on LinkedIn and everything that, um, you know, that you're supposed to do in that window. And then COVID hit. And my retirement date was in the middle well, would have been in the middle of the height of COVID in July of 2020. And mm. I looked at it and me and my wife, you know, as we were going along, we were, you know, I was engaged with a couple discussions with uh, a, di a different companies such as Apex about what SkillBridge would look like. And, you know, me and my wife at the time just determined that, you know, so I actually extended my retirement to the right by six months because of COVID, because of the way the job market had kind of, I wouldn't say it didn't collapse, but it was definitely constrained. And so, you know, I was given, you know, about another six month window. So when I, so to answer your question about SkillBridge, so what I chose to do was, so, so, so Apex by itself was not a 
DOD Skillbridge partner. In fact, a lot of the companies in that I was looking at in the renewable energy space were not in the Charlottesville area, were not partners. So when you go and you do uh, Skillbridge, you, your local installation will have a career skill program coordinator that will be able to tell you, here are all the partnership companies with the DOD Skillbridge program, and you can go to any one of those. And, that, and, and in the Virginia area, it's really confined to Richmond, Norfolk, the Virginia Beach area, because that's where most of the jobs are. You know, you have Fort Lee, Fort Eustis, Norfolk, you know, Norfolk Naval Base, like there's all that there, right? When you, when you had west of I-95, it really starts to dry up. And so, sure. so what I, you know, what I ended up having to do was really negotiate and fight my way into some of these companies. And I say that jokingly as I fight, but it was a lot of really interviewing companies. They were interviewing me, trying to, to network and, and really find people who were, you know, willing to bring me on. And Apex, you know, the chief operating officer for Apex um, was a former Army West Pointer. Um, his name's Ken Young. He's outstanding. And, you know, me and him, had, we had a few conversations back and forth. And he's like, yeah, I'd love to bring you on. And, you know, you can come in and you can do your partnership here and we'll put you inside, you know, kind of the, in one of the business development teams and, and the engineering side. And, you know, we'll look at, you know, what you can bring to the table with your logistics background. And so, you know, in, in June of 2020, instead of retiring, I was, I was moved out of the data S3 position and I was moved and I one day just hung up my uniform and the next day I'm in business casual and I'm working directly for Apex. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad that you, you know, stopped and wanted to kind of go back and cover that period because that that's significant right it's it's important uh talking about any kind of transition from military service it, it's all about timing and right. and you're right you know all, all the folks that are you know transition folks uh talk about you know if you're gonna be serious about transition it needs to be a planned event and it needs to be about a two-year time frame where you start doing things on that checklist uh, moving towards that, you know, final day uh, before your retirement or before you leave service. And, you know, I, I've said this a couple of times in, in my program already. Uh, so folks that, you know, have seen previous episodes, you know, might be tired of hearing this, but, you know, I had a similar experience with transition because uh, I had orders that was coming at, at the end of my two-year command time um, at the battalion. And I had orders uh, and then it changed and they wanted to extend me another year and accepting the extension, then I was going to most likely go to top level school and then time on the joint staff. And that would have all been in, you know, the upper part of Virginia, you know, the DC area. Sure, sure. And so uh, when the decision was, we're not going to do that, we're going to retire. You know, I, I had like 90 days uh, essentially <laughs> between submitting things, things getting approved, and then my ceremony to retire. So it was very condensed. And I I didn't have a plan because, again, I wasn't ready to go until that decision was made. So, yeah, you know, being able to plan and, and execute a successful transition is so important. And that's, to your point, that's why folks really do need to be, you know, thinking about this two years out. But kind of as we were joking uh, before we started recording today about life, you know, life happens and sometimes you just have to make adjustments. Right. Sometimes there are adjustments on the fly, you know, and if you're a planner, you know, you'll figure it out because you're good at planning. You just got to move things around and, you know, have a, have a, uh, a hope and desire that, you know, you're going to be able to pull it off. <laughs> so, right. so you wound up uh, doing that time. It sounds like, you know, you had a good connection with the gentleman that you referred to that was a West Pointer. He, he saw something in you, he, he brought you in. So you were able to experience that. Uh, and so how, how long were you with them again? Did you get so, six months or? No, so, the, so because, so I only, so the program for me was only four and that's in large part due to some, you know, constraints within the Skillbridge program due to mileage. If you're outside of the region, by 50 miles, you can only do it for four months versus whether if you're doing it within a 50 mile radius from your cruising installation, you can do it for six. I, I personally like to see them change that and make it just a standard six month program, but that's okay. I got four months, which is great because it was four months that I wouldn't have had otherwise. 
And right. I think that, you know, with Apex, you know, I, one of the things that, so from a, from a job perspective, Apex was great. I got to learn wind energy, solar energy, the renewable energy side of what Apex is doing and the massive amount of work they're doing across the country to really provide a different type of energy source to power a lot of people's homes and businesses, right? But that was, that was great. But the real benefit of the SkillBridge program, in my opinion, was that my day ended at five o'clock. It accelerated my decompression cycle from the army. And like one of the things that I've talked about, you know, on my LinkedIn, like we, like we, you know, we're, we're both pretty active, is that when I left, the atlas ball of stress, I think, that the army had put on me in the last couple of years just started to melt, melt away. I was able to reconnect with my family. I was able to reconnect with my friends, you know, and it was much more natural because I didn't have the looming stress of what I was doing for the army. I love what I did for the army. I mean, I'm not, I won't ever sugarcoat that. It just came down to, it was my time. And once I was in a, once I was in a corporate setting, it really became clear how much stress I was carrying and through everything that I was doing, you know, it, it, that, that four month window helped me reorient and refine myself. Right. Yeah. You know, what you just said there is pretty profound because I think a lot of us don't realize that until we're no longer wearing the uniform, right. uh, just how high of a level you perform, just how really high the expectations and standards are and that there really is no clock, right? You know, you, you get there early and you leave when you leave. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how many, I have no idea how many hours I was at work any given day. Uh, you know, 12 probably isn't exaggerating, you know, and, right. and, and you bring it home. It's hard not to bring it home, you know, especially when you get into command, you know, you're, you're just, it's, it's what you do. And, you know, there's a lot of goodness to that, you know, uh, but yeah, that that amount, that level of stress, and those things. Once you <laughs> once you transition out, it, it's a whole other world, and it's right. nice that you have, you know, some ability to kind of control aspects of your life that you really didn't have control over. Uh, now, as far as the SkillBridge program, this is kind of a, a side note, and I'm just interested in your opinion on this because you, again, you went through the program. I, I see on LinkedIn, and I'm sure you do too. A lot of folks. Haven't seen it much lately. Uh, so either maybe things have changed a bit or maybe because of, of COVID, I, I don't know. But you would see at for some period of time, people complaining about skill bridge in terms of, you know, not getting approved that, you know, hey, my, my command didn't approve me. And, you know, everyone's got an opinion as to why. And, you know, I, I've always, I've always found that interesting because you want to look at both sides of this, right? Because, you know, the military is not an organization that's premise is to help you get a job when you leave the military. You know, it's about fighting and, and winning our nation's wars. And the military, you know, I'm sure the army isn't a whole lot different from the Marine Corps in terms of what they expect you to do in service. And, you know, the Marine Corps is small. And, you know, we go through, you know, boom and, and bust with personnel, right? A lot of times we're very shorthanded. And so there's not a whole lot of bandwidth. And so, unfortunately, some folks wind up carrying a little bit more water than others. You know, not, it's not everybody, but some folks are, are very consequential to what happens. And depending on who's there and what you're doing, uh, sometimes it's hard to let folks go. So, you know, I think a lot of times folks don't really think about that and they, they're upset because they didn't get the opportunity and they feel that it wasn't fair. In some cases, it might not be, but I, I just always found it interesting that people come out blazing and they just, you know, <laughs> they kind of forget about their, about, you know, some of the things that maybe they did and forgetting how, uh, tough it is to balance things sure. uh, for the folks that are responsible for making things work. And so right. 
how, how, you know, you, you got accepted. And so for folks that want to do this, what advice do you have for somebody that wants to go to a skill bridge program? Uh, you know, some folks just think, Hey, I want to do it, fill out the paperwork and they send it up and they hope it works. You know, how much did you play a part in shaping your destiny possibly for getting approval with that? Did you just have a, a, a good command or were you helping inform along the way as this thing made it up the chain of command? How, what, what was your experience? Well, so, I mean, I think for me, it was a little bit different only because I worked directly. I mean, as the brigade S3, my colonel, you know, the 06 of the brigade, my brigade commander was my approval authority. So I was already had a very open relationship with him anyway. That was easy for me to be able to do it, but it still required a lot of communication about what I wanted to do. I mean, he needed to know what he was, what, because, you know, like you said, you know, units will continue to carry you all the way through until you're no longer part of them. So you count against their books, so to speak. But I think you hit on something that that is, it's really key. There are people who we've seen on LinkedIn or other places complain that they don't get the same approval or haven't been able to go through it or whatever. And, you know, to those people, you know, for, for what you went through, you know, I feel for you because there are people out there like we've talked about who, for whatever reason, have decided that they don't want, they want to decide. I think for the people who are listening in and people just in general, you know, the end of military service comes for us all one way or another. And I think what ends up happening is people tend to forget that at some point that you're going to be going through the same exact thing and you're going to want to use the same services that are available to every soldier when it's your time. And so, you know, in the army, you hear the phrase taking care of soldiers. I'm sure the Marine Corps has a similar phrase or, you know, helping. And, and well, yeah, there's always going to be a balance of mission versus what you can do with personnel and what needs to be done. And some situations may necessitate that those people don't get that opportunity. And that's a hard decision that a commander has to make. But I would venture to say that there's probably 80% of all the people who've been denied were denied because they weren't, whoever made that decision probably wasn't looking at it through the lens of this could be me someday. So I want the same consideration when it's my time. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I absolutely agree with that because, you know, we all have a reckoning uh, when we are leaving the military because it happens right. to all of us. And, and we all leave for different reasons, too. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, to me, it says a lot about your your then boss. If, if you were the operations officer and they were good enough to let you go, man, that's tremendous. They must have had somebody in the bullpen there that uh, was able to step up. <laughs> Well, yeah, they did. And, and they had a lot of good, you know, the, the shop in general was, was humming along pretty well. So I was very lucky. Like I won't even, I won't sugarcoat it all. My boss was tremendous in supporting me in that. And, and so that's, you know, if I'm a one-off and, and I'm not the standard example, I get that. I do, you know, my previous statement though stands. I feel like a lot of people just need to, when they see those requests come through and they do have soldiers that are, or sailors, airmen, marines, coast guard people, who are going to go through that, look it through the lens of at some point it's going to be you. Do you want those opportunities? And if so, find a way to make it happen. No, absolutely. Uh, mission and people, you know, you, you can't do one without the other. Right. Cool. Okay. Well, so now as kind of getting back to the whole transition thing with you. Yeah. Um, so when you finished your time, uh, skill bridge time, did you have any any time in between, uh, did you have any downtime that you were able to take, you know, kind of just to adjust for yourself or, you know, go on a, you know, go hiking with some friends or, you know, go someplace with your family? Did you have any of that kind of time to, you know, recalibrate or, yeah. or did, you know, what, what did you wind up doing? Well, I, a little bit. So what I did was I used my Stillbridge time, like I said, to be kind of my recalibration time. So because we're right. in COVID, you know, my time with Apex was largely remote. And so I was in a remote still room. So I was in my house every day. And, you know, rarely, most of my, my interactions with the people at Apex Clean Energy was all through Microsoft Teams 
or through or through you know Zoom or, or whatever virtual platform. So you know I never physically worked with any of them. I worked you know pretty much in my house, and so it was almost like my decompression time was six months of just be with my family. And so you know on one side it was nice because I mean here you are you get to spend all the time with your family you get to do all these things. Your work day is you know, eight in the morning, you punch out at 4.30 in the afternoon, and then the phone never rings. Like in the Army and the Marine Corps and everywhere else, you're, you know, the phone will ring at nine o'clock at night, and it's like, this is what I have to do, because that's yes. part of your job. At 4.30, the phone, like my phone didn't ring ever again after 4.30, and that was like, you just get used to the, you get used to everything being so loud, but the silence, you know, the joke of silence is deafening, but that silence was outstanding. And it really allowed me time to just, you know, like I started to enjoy running because it's what I wanted to do, not because it's what the <laughs> army made me do, right? right? I was enjoying, you know, being outside with my dog and my kid, my kids and my, my daughter and my wife, you know, like just hiking and doing all these things that I didn't have time to do because you know, I, I was a geo bachelor in Fort Lee, even though I, because my family lived in Charlottesville. So it was, it was this, this weird time, but I mean, it, I really got a chance to just kind of reset. And so at the end of my Skillbridge time, like I didn't really take a break. I already had my break. So I really moved, you know, I was, I was fortunate enough to be accepted and take a, a position in what is a business that was called Parasense, which has subsequently changed names twice now since I became an employee. It's all the same company, but it's gone from Parasense to Backrack to now MSA, the safety company. So like I took that position in November 2020 and really that's where I've been ever since. All right. Well, you know, that's, you know, this, the COVID thing, that, that dynamic has changed so much, right? And, and, and asking you that question, you know, it's just, even though we've been in COVID, for almost two years now, it, it's it's funny. I wasn't even really thinking about how much COVID was going to, you know, confine and shape this particular discussion. Um, and yeah, boy, you were you were fortunate that you were able to spend that time at home during those months uh, because it, there's a, a reacquaintance that you go through with your family if you've been away for a while, right. and you know. It is an amazing. I there. I don't recall the person's name uh, from a post yesterday, but there's a a Navy chief. Uh, she's retiring, and she put out a post, and she's in her car. She's got like a flight jacket on, and you know her her flight gear underneath of it. And she's talking about, hey, you know, I'm, I'm at the end of my time, and I don't know what the heck I want to do. <laughs> You know, I'm kind of I'm kind of anxious about this. You know, I'm used to the Navy telling me what time to get up, where to go, what time yeah. to eat, you know, what uniform to wear. You know, all these things that we're so regimented with that becomes who we are. You know, the processes that we're, you know, that we know and do every day. And you know, she was just expressing a little bit of anxiety about what it's going to be like leaving. And you know, I just, you know, I just remember the immense feeling of freedom that came with leaving and it was immediate. You know, I, I didn't have a, I, I didn't do scale bridge. I don't think, you know, well, I know scale bridge wasn't around when I transitioned in 2012, but, you know, with that freedom, it also comes a little bit of, of I don't want to say loneliness, be, uh, you know, maybe a little bit, you know, about missing the military because, uh, you know, even folks that, leave the military because they're just done with the military. And, and that happens too. folks are just, you know, they're frustrated and they decide, Hey, I want to do something else. But at some point, I think most of us miss certain elements, certain things about the military and absolutely the people. Right. And so, you know, in that transition, you, you know, you were talking about, you know, walking the dog or going for a run because, Hey, this is what I want to do now. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how all that feels so different, you know, when you're disassociated from, you know, requirements of the military and even things that you would do in the military even seem different because they are, you know, the, the, the liberation, the feeling of, wow, you know, <laughs> I, I can kind of 
right. create my own path now. You know, that that's it's an enlightening feeling. And it, it sounds like you absolutely experienced that uh, during your during your time uh, in Skillbridge. So, um, okay, well, um, now in your transition path, uh, is there anything in particular that you wish maybe you would have done different or, you know, anything that you want to talk about that you feel uh, that was a decision that was an extremely good or successful decision you made as well, it applied I, to that time? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think looking back at my transition, I think I started too late. Number one, I think that that's, that, that's evident. So when I, when I started and, 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 and by that, I mean, it wasn't the, the process of exiting the army that I mean by that. It was the process of trying to change my perception of who I am and who I was. So I took, so I started in September of 2019, really to, was when I really committed to retiring. And when I booted up my LinkedIn profile in September of 2019, so I had built my profile back in 2011, just because I was like, oh, LinkedIn's new, I'll give it a shot, I'll try it, did it, forgot about it, never even touched it again. 2019, I dusted it off and I had like 12 people that I was connected with. And of those 12, I think like nine of them had like ceased being on the, it was like connected to a dead profile, right? Like, like they had all decided <laughs> to drop off. And right. I realized that if I was gonna use this platform, use LinkedIn or use whatever platform I needed to commit to it. And I really had to get out of my shell and really start forging relationships with people that I didn't know that I needed, I just, I needed to start making friends and connecting because my entire circle, just like you, just like everybody else was all in the military. Well, rephrase that, people have friends outside. My, my entire circle was all military related and I needed to expand out of that. So I would say, one of the things I would say that I wish I had done earlier was expand outside, expand my network and start asking a lot more questions about what corporate America and what the outs, what, what it's like not being in the military of my friends, family, everybody else. So I had a better understanding of what I was going to walk into. Like that's first and foremost. And if right. I'd done that, I probably would have been better. Uh, you look like you want to say something. Go ahead before I cue you. Oh no, I'm just I'm I'm, I'm agreeing because you know okay. I, I kind of did something similar as well, and you know because I I left in 2012, and I think it was around 2011 when I got on LinkedIn as well. And it looked cool, but I just didn't have time for it, right? And uh, LinkedIn is a, is, is a very valuable tool for folks that are in the military transitioning because, you know, if you do it right, you're looking to connect with people that it's kind of a twofold thing. You, you want to connect with a lot of different people, right? But you also want to focus on what industry do I want to go in, you know, and then try to look for folks in the industry that you're interested in. So you can connect with and build relationships, ask questions, maybe develop right. a mentor, you know, using LinkedIn as a tool. So yeah, I'm just, you know, I was just gonna say, yeah, that, that's, uh, I, I agree. I, I could have done that better as well, but it's, it's a learning, it's a kind of an iterative learning process. So the other, no, I appreciate that. So the other, the other thing that I did was I committed myself to being to, to trying everything that was available to me as a veteran resource. Like I didn't, if it, if it was out there and they were saying, we support veterans, sign up for free, get support. So I did it all. I did hire mill and, and for everybody who's listening, and for people who are gonna see this, I'm about to give you all big shout outs, okay? So I did hire military, I did hire our heroes, I did hire, US, hire, hire USA, I did American corporate partners, I did the commit, the commit program, the commit foundation, I you know, did the IMVF from Syracuse University for the, for the Onward Opportunity. Like I did, if it was there and it was free and it was a veteran resource, I signed up and I did it. I had a mentor from ACP who was outstanding and helped me through a lot of different things. I had, I did the Commit Foundation, which if people don't know what the Commit Foundation is, is it's really a program designed not to help you transition, but to find who you are because after, after 20 years of, of army or, or military service, like you said about that Navy chief we were just talking about, there comes a point where you identify as that and you have to pull yourself away from that. And that was key. So I so look, these programs, they work. 
use them. I, I would say abuse them because they are there for you and don't turn any of them down. You might think, well, I don't need it. I've already done that. I've already built my resume. Great. You need other people's input. You need their perspective. And most importantly, their resources for you down the road if you ever have questions. I still talk to my mentor. I still talk to my people that have all been part of my life over this last year and a half. And it's helped me tremendously in just normalizing what I'm supposed to be doing. Wow, man, that is a mic drop moment right there. <laughs> right. That's tremendous, Mike. Uh, it, it, it really is. You know, the fact that, you, you know, um, you know, Herb Thompson, he talks about own yeah. your journey. Mm -hmm. You just own the hell out of your journey in, in that segment right there, because, you know, you did the things that most folks wish they would have done, right? That's, that's huge because it is about you. It's not about kind of waiting to see who's gonna help. It's figuring things out. Uh, sometimes you have to be the person to go find the resources and, and put the pieces together. Right. But if you do what you did and connect with those organizations, that's what they're there to do. And they'll help you with you know, putting that puzzle together. And so that, that's tremendous. Now, now, what was the organization that you said wasn't career focused that they were you know, looking to help you, you know, kind of find who you are and, and the, the purpose yeah, building, so that, who was that? That's the Commit Foundation. And so that's that, that program by itself, they do resume help, they do interview with some help and you can get some of that, but that's not what its primary purpose is. They align you with a coach and the coach is there to help you figure out what you want to do. So you like talk about the Navy chief that was having anxiety on her post and she said, I don't know what to do. If you were to, if you were to rewind two years ago and be like, who is Major Mike Clemmer and what does he want to do? I would have been like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I know that I'm transitioning out and that I want to do something. I think I want to do renewable energy. And that sounds really like an interesting career field for me, but no idea. And it was because, you know, especially you're, you're, you're committed at that point to the service that you're, you're living, that's the world you're living in. Like, I, I'll be very upfront and honest, that was my sole focus in life, right? Like, I had my family and everything else, but if you were to extract me from the military, it was very hard to separate my identity as a army officer from Mike Clemmer. And what, did, and what needed to happen was this program from the Commit Foundation did that. It made me pause and really think about it. And I had weekly one-on-one -on -one sessions with, you know, a counselor who would be who would be like, "Hey, let's talk about it. Why do you want to do this? What are some of your goals?" And there was homework involved. And that, at the end of it, you got to sit back and you got to be like, "Wow, like this is really what this is me. That this is who I want to do. It's not Uncle Sam talking. It's not what is expected of me. It's it's what does Mike want to do?" And that was the only program, really, I think that I did that was solely focused on who I was and who I wanted to be. Wow, that's uh, that, that's enlightening because I actually, you know, I, I've been in the transition space for quite a, quite a while now, and I don't, that doesn't ring a bell. So that that's a great resource right. because what you said is so necessary, you know, because of, and especially for folks that have made a complete career out of it. I think, you know, by the time you're at 20 years, you're, you're, you're bought and sold and, and that's, that's all, you know, now it doesn't mean that hard chargers that, you know, maybe do four years don't have some of those same things. Right. Because maybe even when you're still kind of, you know, new at this, if you look at a continuum of time, you know, four years, to 20 years, you're probably just as motivated and, you know, on fire, but maybe you've decided to go a different route and unhinging yourself from, who you are in the military is, is difficult. Right. Um, so yeah, having a resource like that is tremendous. And, and what I, what I would like to do, Mike, is uh, after we're done with the interview, if, if you could just, you know, shoot me in either a, an email or a, a DM uh, and list off those organizations and we can, uh, we can, we can apply uh, those names and links when I go to post your uh your video so folks can can look in the description part 
of the post and see those oh, organizations right. because I, I think that's a, a good thing to be able to, you know, kind of amplify for folks that will see this, that, you know, hey, this is what Mike did and these are good organizations. Right. So, no, that's that's fantastic. And again, that, to me, it says a lot about who you are in terms of shaping your, your future, you know, and understanding that there's a need for change, change is coming. I need to embrace that change because that's how I'm going to ride the front part of this wave and get to where I, you know, actually, you know, where I want to go. Right. So, okay. Well, so let's get into what you're doing now. Uh, You know, you're, you're in a a director position. You said the company has, has, has changed names a couple of times and it's it's happened since, you know, you've been with them as well. So uh, what can you tell us about what you're doing now? Yeah. So, I'm the director of military affairs and the service business for Bacharach slash MSA, the Mine Safety Appliance and Safety Company, right? MSA Safety. And, you know, so this job is interesting. It's still out. So what we do is we do refrigerant leak detection and we do a lot of cloud-based systems where we can kind of see different, you know, what you're used to seeing in the grocery store, the black, the chillers, um, large scale facilities where there's a lot of air conditioning, you know, everything has the R134A refrigerant in it, or now the new R404A refrigerant. And so what we do is we monitor these systems to make sure that they're not leaking and they're, run- and they're running right. And we can see, you know, global, well, wherever we are, we can kind of see it through some of our connected services, but we can even tell when systems are failing even around the United States, even if we're not there. And then we, we send data reports to our customers and let them know. From, from the, you know, that's the overarching side of the business. We also have some government contracts and some other, some government requirements where our systems are on the US Navy fleets to protect sailors. They're with the United States Coast Guard. We have systems in with some of the US Air Force. And so it's, you know, and, and we're looking, you know, always, always to expand, obviously. But it's, it's really interesting because my role as the director of military affairs involves compliance with contracting, which is something I'm familiar with from my time in the army. It involves absolutely. It involves the fulfillment and how we fulfill our product to the military, and when we're, we're going to do. It. And then also being, you know, essentially continuing the servant role and the maintenance role, which is something that I know as a logistics officer, being able to provide services aboard these ships that we continue to calibrate whenever they come into port so that we're making sure that the sailors stay as safe as they can when they're out to sea so that they're not entering an area, you know, inside of a ship that had a refrigerant dump and all of a sudden, you know, it's a, it's not a safe area for them to walk into. And we can tell them that, but I mean, we can't, you know, from a cloud system tell a U.S. Navy ship that's out to sea, but there's local alarms on the, on the, the, the ships that will tell sailors, hey, don't go in here because of this and you got to go through these technical procedures and everything else you know to, to fix that area. Right. Yeah, that oh that's that's pretty incredible. You know, the technology that enables all the things that you guys are are doing today is is tremendous. You know, it's right. and, and leverage, leveraging that technology smartly the way you guys are. Uh, you know, what do, do you have any sense of, you know, a breakdown percentage wise of how much of the business your company is doing is military vice, you know, other other business? Well, I mean, I th- so we were just I, it may be hard to, to know, but yeah, my, so we, we do a small portion. I mean, you know, we're, we're probably about, I'd say, you know, two to three percent military vice commercial. Right. I mean, it's our area yeah. the military side is, is small, but it's really important in my opinion, because of the fact that, you know, until I had become a part of Paris, Paris Ends, Backrack, MSA, whichever company, you know, MSA now, until I become a part of them, like, if you would ask me, hey, what is refrigerant leak detection? I'd be like, I have no clue. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's all Greek to me. I have no idea that that's even a thing. No idea that there, that there are products out there that can tell you whether or not that can measure the parts per million of refrigerant that's leaked into a space. Never, never knew that existed. And right. so, and who knew? <laughs> now, and you're like, well, that seems like why wouldn't there be a system that does that? And quite frankly, there, there, I mean, there's a lot of systems. I think the one that we have is pretty good. 
and does a lot of the applications, especially on the military side, and can go into a lot of different applications. But you know, I, I really like my job. I was I was fortunate enough to land here. Um, the the gentleman who brought me aboard, Wayne George, was outstanding, and you know, I've and, and really continued to work with him. And you know, through all these acquisitions that my company has been through, you know, continue to to do what is the most important, which is provide safe safe area safe work areas for anybody. Really, that if you're working in a space that has refrigerant, it's a safe area. Well, that that's a fantastic mission to have, right? You know, people's lives and, and safety are paramount. And if your organization uh, is able to do that well, and obviously they are, you know, that's, you know, that's the best of both worlds, especially for folks serving in the military. Like you said, you know, when you're underway, uh, you know, it's a lot different being underway than it is being at port, you know, when you have problems and having a system that can do the things you're talking about, even though they're out at sea, you know, having the local, um, you know, uh, technology shipboard that can enable them to remain safe uh, is is really significant because, you know, years back, how did you know when things like that were happening? Probably right. once it's too late, right? And then that's well, a whole right. other story, yeah. So, no, you know, and it is, I'm happy for you that you found a, a position that you enjoy uh, and one that you feel like you're contributing to, uh, that your your past in the military, you know, what you did at, as a logistician quartermaster, those experiences are helping you um, apply, you know, reason and, and goodness to your job. And they obviously saw that in you and, and that's why you're sitting in that director's seat. So that's hats off to you. Uh, that's, well, that's tremendous, you. absolutely. Now, with, with that being said, and looking at my watch, as we talked about on our uh, phone call yesterday, time goes by quick, and we're right. already at uh, 57 minutes. So I, I do want to leave a little bit of time here uh, to talk about uh, you as an entrepreneur. Now, you know, we've agreed that we're going to have a whole other segment to talk about that. But um, in this you know, brief couple of minutes, what, what do you want to share about what you're doing now as an entrepreneur? Yeah, so I mean, you come out of the army and you're like, well, everything's open to you, right? You can do whatever you want to do. You can, you know, the world is your oyster. So as even, even you know, as my direct, position as director of military affairs, you know, I've always kind of decided that I wanted to have my own company and try to do my own thing a little bit. And really, as a, as a, people use the term side hustle, but what I really wanted to do was kind of forge my way into the business world. I've never really done it on my own. And so, you know, Aerial Resupply Coffee is kind of what was birthed from that, from that um, desire. And, you know, I, and so, you know, coming from the support world, you know, I feel like, you know, I can do and continue the same level of excellence that I did while I was supporting the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guard in variety capacities for the military, but I can take what I've learned there and apply it to everybody. So really, my mantra with aerial resupply is supporting those who support others and really focusing on recognizing the hard work that the people behind the scenes do to support our first responders. And that's that's really kind of my my goal moving forward with, with this venture. Man, that's that's wonderful. You know, <laughs> it sounds like you uh, rehearsed that to the nth no, degree because you, there's no you nailed that. No, not, well, I can say it, but it's not really no, no. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm teasing. Like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm teasing about that. But no, you, you, you did that very well, Mike. And that uh, the passion that comes along with that tells me that you're on to something. Um, and who better than a person that was spent a career in support, you know, right. to be able to, to bring that uh, to where it is now. And I am absolutely looking forward to continuing this conversation about what you're doing now as an entrepreneur, as we discussed uh, on another show. So for Folks that are, are interested uh, in, in that part of Mike, uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to dedicate a whole uh, program to that at a later date. So, right. um, you know, that's that's coming. So, all right. Well, um, we're at 11.59 now, so we're just shy of, of, of uh, one hour. It is In wrapping this thing up, is, is there any, any message that you want to leave with folks uh, who are going to be transitioning here or even veterans who – have made the transition and they're still not quite sure, you know, what they want to do, or they're not having success finding their path. Any, any thoughts there for folks like that? 
Yeah, I would say something. We, I would say that my, from a final thought perspective, just, just know you were somebody before you decided to join and raise your right hand and join the service. That person never went away. And so you owe it to yourself and you owe it, you know, you, you've given your time to the country, you've given your time to, to, to being within the service, whichever service you chose. And now it's time to really return to your roots, return to who you are, and you owe yourself the same level of commitment that you gave every single person or organization you're part of for whatever length of time you had. So if you do that, you'll be you'll be fine and you'll be happy. And you know, I think I speak for both you and I, Scott, on this. Like for anybody who's watching this, feel free to reach out to both of us. And you know, happy to happy to engage with anybody who wants to talk about this or anything else that happens with um, you know, just the whole transition journey. Yeah, amen to that, Mike. I, I couldn't have said that any better. And you know, you, you again, you, you nailed it. And it, it's also important that folks understand that they can do that last element you spoke of. You know, reaching out. It's important to reach out for for help or to get you know some opinions of others who have come before you because right. you know they, they may have some information that is that one piece you've been looking for. So, absolutely. Well, Mike. Uh, we're at the end of the program here. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Uh, your closing comments was another big reason why I wanted to bring you on the program because I, I knew that you know you would share that with folks because uh, you're very open ab about that and you know you share it very well on LinkedIn. And I, I think that folks that see this, it's going to resonate with them. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for your service in the Army. Thank uh, your family as well for their service and for, you know, much success to you and your family here moving forward and everything you guys do. You know, God bless you guys. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Scott. Okay, Mike. Hey, take care, brother. Thank you.